So this next note, we're going to talk about specifically techniques involved in analyzing experimental data. Main thing that we're, we're trying to do in any type of experimental discipline is we are looking for correlations. So that's the big thing is we're looking for correlations and there are two types, well, technically three. We're looking for direct, indirect, or if there is no correlation at all. And that's a possibility too. So let's talk about what is the difference between say a direct correlation and an indirect correlation. Direct correlations are correlations where um, when one parameter increases, the other parameter increases as well. And they tend to make um, uh, graphs that uh, go up and to the right. So for example, you're driving along and let's say this axis represents the distance and this axis over here represents the time. So let's say you're moving in a positive direction. So as time increases, so does your distance. We consider that to be a direct correlation. Now let's consider what an indirect correlation is. Well, in that case, that would be something where one parameter increases, the other one decreases. So let's say we're dropping a ball, for example, from some height over time. So as time goes on, um, that ball drops and we have an indirect. So as time increases, the height decreases. So that's the difference between what we call a direct and indirect correlation. However, sometimes there's no correlation at all. So for example, if you have an object that is standing still, completely still, as time increases, there is no change in its position. So there is no correlation between the passage of time and the motion of that object. All right, next. So whenever you're doing an experiment, you're usually comparing one parameter to another parameter. And that's where we get these terms independent variable versus the dependent variable. All right, so let's explore that idea a little bit. So let's say you wanted to do an experiment where you are trying to, let's say, for example, um, map the or figure out the speed of a car. You're observing how a car is moving as time goes on. All right, so here is our... Uh, our little car here and our car is moving in the forward direction so now let's say you want to record some of the information okay so as the car is moving you want to compare let's say its position versus the time all right so now which one is going to be the dependent and which one is going to be the independent well it entirely depends no pun intended who am i kidding the pun was totally intended it entirely depends on um what decisions you're going to make before you run the actual experiment. So let's say, for example, we decide that we are going to measure the position. So we're going to measure the position of the vehicle at the following times. Let's say at the, uh, the uh, initial position at zero seconds, then at uh, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15, and 20. So what we've done here is everything in this column here was decided beforehand. We, we, we pre-decided these before we even ran the experiment. So that makes these ones the independent variable because the, these numbers over here, the position, are completely dependent on whatever we decided before we ran the lab. So the results that we're going to get for our distances or our positions are entirely dependent on what we chose over here or our times. There is, however, a different way that we could have done this. So instead, what we could have is instead of setting the times, we could have instead set the distances. So let's say we're going to measure the time at the following uh, positions. At the initial position, at let's say the um, 20 meter mark, the 40, the 60, the 80 meter mark. So that means that the time is now the dependent variable, and our position is the independent. So whatever you decide first before you run the experiment, whatever numbers you choose before you even run the experiment, those are considered to be your independent variables. And the numbers that you actually acquire during the experiment that you get from these original assumptions, these values are considered to be the dependent. So again, it all depends on uh, context of how you set up the laboratory, the lab, I should say. Generally speaking, time is usually the independent variable as a general rule. Now, 
another another idea about correlation. So we've talked about uh, direct correlations and indirect correlations, um, but there is something that is important to note is that just because two things are correlated doesn't necessarily mean there is a causal relationship. That needs to be explored a little bit. So what we mean by a causal relationship is that it doesn't imply, what I'm saying is that it does not imply that just because two things look related, it doesn't mean that one caused the other or vice versa. You need a little bit more evidence for that. So you can have a correlation, but you don't know if it's necessarily uh, a link. And I'm going to have a, I'll show you a humorous example to explain the difference. So here we have a perfect example. We are going to compare Internet Explorer market share versus the murder rate in the United States. So if you take a look um, as the um, Internet Explorer's market share decreases, you can see that the murder rate is also decreasing. So if you look at the trends here, you can see a correlation in the data. It looks like that the two are linked. This is obviously hilariously not likely. Now, that being said, I am certain that all of us at one point have wanted to um, murder our computers based on the uh, slowness of Internet Explorer, but um, the th two things are not causally linked. Still, this is pretty hilarious. So again, so causation means that one causes the other. So it would be completely unreasonable to uh, make a conclusion that Internet Explorer is responsible for the uh, American murder rate. Um, so those are these are coincidental correlations. Um, now, when you talk about causation, there's also the direction that you have to be concerned with. So there is a strong causal link between, say, cigarette smoke and lung cancer. Well, one could say, based on that, without the, the appropriate compelling evidence, that you could make the argument that lung cancer causes cigarettes. Now, that's an absurd statement, of course. Um, it's the, the causal relationship is in the other way. It's the smoking causes lung cancer. But that's another issue about causal relationships. So it's one thing to have a correlation. Then it's a question of establishing causation. And then the third thing is which way the causation goes. Does one cause the other or vice versa? So it makes these things a little bit more complex than just on than just what it may appear on the surface. And these are actually important ideas to hold in your head, especially, especially um, when you're um, being marketed something, for example, or um, if it's a, a political debate. Uh, often politicians love to throw out stats uh, without context. So um, having the ability to sort of deconstruct that and realize that, you know, just because two graphs look like uh, a similar shape doesn't necessarily mean that they are related or that they are related, but there is a third uh, unspoken causal relationship that's causing it. And these are very important ideas in general, not just in science, but, you know, for, for life in general. All right. So let's talk about things called linear relationships. All right. So a linear relationship um, implies that um, when you graph something, it would make a straight line. It means they're directly proportional. So let's take a look at this example over here. So what we have is we've got um, distance versus time. So in order to sort of get an idea of what this relationship might be, we don't look at the data directly. We look at the relationships within the data. So the first thing we're going to look at is the jump from two to four. Well, the jump from two to four, that's times two. Now, the jump from two to six, that's a jump of three times. Now, the jump from two to eight, well, that's a jump of four times. So these things here on the right-hand side are what we call our multipliers. Now, we go over to the dependent variable. And I should clarify that in physics, this column is always the independent, and this column over here is always the dependent, which is kind of the opposite of the way we often do it in math. Not exactly sure why we do it this way, but... All right, so now let's take a look at this relationship. So the jump from 100 
to 200 is two times. The jump from 100 to 300 is three times. And the jump from 100 to 400 is four times. So now what we do is we look at the multipliers on both sides. If the multipliers are the same, we're good. We're good. And that means that we have a linear relationship and we can conclusively say that D is proportional to T. And if we were to graph this relationship, it would make a straight line like that. Well, a little straighter. I could have probably used a ruler. All right, so let's try a little sample here. So let's look at the data here. So we're going to start off with, now again, this is our independent variable, and A would be our dependent variable. All right, so now let's uh, look at the jumps here. So the jump from 5 to 10, that's two times. The jump from 5 to 15, well, that's three times. 5 to 20, four times. 5 to 25, five times. And the jump from 5 to six, uh, 30 is six times. Now let's check out the independent variable. So the jump from 3 to 6, that's two times. 3 to 9, that's three times. 3 to 12, that's four times. So now let's do some pattern re recognition. If we, can, if we can predict it, that should be a five times jump. And this should be a six times jump. So this should be a 15, and that should be 18. So therefore, A is proportional to B. So next, let's take a look at non-linear relationships. And these are relationships that do not make a straight line. So we're going to first start off with the quadratic. Now, for those of you um, should remember that quadratic means squared. So we should see a square in the relationship. Well, let's do a little bit of analysis. So here's the independent. This is our dependent variable. And we're going to analyze the multipliers. So the jump from 1 to 2, that's 2 times. The jump from 1 to 3, that's 3 times. The jump from 1 to 4, that's 4 times. Now the jump from 1 to 4, that's 4 times. The jump from 1 to 9, that's 9 times. And the jump from 1 to 16, that's 16 times. Okay, so now when we look, the multipliers don't match. Okay, so here's the deal. The, the, the deal that we need to do is this. We only affect change on the independent variable. So we have to figure out what, what change can I make to these multipliers? So what change can I make to these multipliers to make them look like these multipliers over here? So it should be fairly obvious that to turn a 2 into a 4, we have to square it. To turn a 3 into a 9, we have to square that. To turn a 4 into a 16, we square it. So um, we're going to test. We're going to test it. So then what you do is you make a new column with your adjustment to the parameter. So 1 squared is equal to 1. 2 squared is equal to 4. 3 squared is equal to 9. 4 squared is equal to 16. So now what we do is we look at the relationships. So now we can clearly see that the jump from 1 to 4 is 4 times. 1 to 9 is 9 times. And 1 to 16 is 16 times. And it's very obvious that we have the same relationship on the other side. So therefore, D is proportional to T squared. And that's what the D versus T squared would look like, as opposed to the D versus T, which makes a parabola. All right, so let's give this a shot. Another example. So the jump from 1 to 2, 2 times. 1 to 4, that's 4 times. And 1 to 6, 6 times. And 1 to 8, 8 times. Now let's see what happens on the independent variable side. The jump from 5 to 20, 4 times. From 5 to 80, 16 times. The jump from 5 to 180 is 36 times. And the jump from 5 to 320 is a jump of 64 times. So again, let's take a look at the multipliers on the independent variable. And to turn a 2 into a 4, we need to square it. To turn a 4 into a 16, square. To turn a 6 into 36, you square. And 8 into a 64, you square that as well. So therefore, A is proportional to B squared. Now, there is one thing that you should be doing. Now, it seems fairly obvious, but um, with these easier ones, it's, it's, a, it's, it's maybe a little bit more obvious. But what we're going to do here is what you should always do is you should actually have another column to test your results. So again, this would be our B squared. So we take 1 and we square it. It gives us 1, 2, and we square it. That gives us 4, 16, 36, 64. And then, very obviously, the multipliers line up nicely. Next, 
something called the inverse relationship. This is actually a bit of a misnomer because it really should be the reciprocal relationship, but we often just call it the inverse relationship. So the inverse relationship, uh, a dead giveaway is when you see the um, growth of the parameters. So let's say, for example, so let's consider our, our value f. We can see that it grows in this direction, whereas our other parameter, the growth is in the opposite, the opposite way. It's actually diminishing. The moment you see that, the moment you see that one parameter is increasing and the other parameter is decreasing, you already have a pretty good idea that you're going to take the reciprocal. So when we focus on that, we're going to take a look. So now to get this one half, that's really just this number divided by that one. And that gives us the one half. Um, to get one quarter, it's this divided by this. Of course, I would just give you 0.25, which would be a quarter. And to get this value over here would be this divided by this. And again, uh, that 0.2, that gives you one over five. So now when we compare, when you compare these multipliers to these multipliers, to turn a one half into a two, we take the reciprocal of one half. To, find the, um, to turn a one quarter into a, a four, we take the reciprocal of the one quarter. And with one fifth to five, we take the reciprocal of that five. So therefore, F is proportional to one over T. And then we compare it. So this is the reciprocal of these values here. So that means 100 is the reciprocal of this. 200 is the reciprocal of that. 400 is the reciprocal of this. 500 is the reciprocal of this. And then, of course, we do the multiplier analysis. We look at that multiplier, this one and this one, and you can see just by inspection, you can tell that they are uh, in line with themselves. So we know that F is indeed proportional to 1 over T. So next, let's take a look at the square root relationship. So again, let's take a look at the multipliers. We have 4 times, 9 times, 12.25 times, 2 times, 3 times, 3.5 times. All right, so again, we can only ever affect the independent variable. Do not touch that one. This one is okay, bad. So we need to turn this 4 into a 2, this 9 into a 3, and this 12.25 into 3.5. Well, to turn a 4 into a 2, take the square root. A 9 into a 3, take a square root. And take my word for it, 12.25 into a 3.5, you take the square root. So therefore, C is proportional to the square root of D. And finally, the inverse square relationship. Now, sometimes you have to do more than one thing at a time. So you'll have to apply two adjustments. So again, if we take a look at the data here, we can see that the data is growing in this direction, but it is diminishing um, in this uh, for this column. So for the column in F, it is growing. For the column R, it is diminishing. So the very first thing that you do, as soon as you see that, you're going to take the reciprocal of our R values. All right. But here's the deal. Um, sorry, of our R multipliers, not our R values. I meant the multipliers. So we're going to take a look at these. So we know that we're going to take the reciprocal of these. Well, if I take the reciprocal of one half, that's a two. And if I take the reciprocal of four, a one quarter, that's a four. And if I take the reciprocal of one sixth, that's obviously six. But the multiplier still did not match. So we have to do something in addition. So we also, not only do we have to take the reciprocal, but we also have to square. And if we do that, that gives us a 4, 16, and a 36. So therefore, F squared. And again, test your data. So applying this, so 1 over 1 squared is just 1. So to get this number, we take this and square it. And that gives us this, so on and so forth. And there you go. Easy as that.